In the last few videos, I described the basic five-stage pipeline. Now let's talk about a few potential problems that, that we encounter when dealing with this pipeline. The first is the possibility of a structural hazard or a structural conflict. So we said that you have an instruction that accesses instruction memory here, does register read, ALU, and then goes to the data memory stage over here. And while you're performing the data memory operation over here, there could be an instruction later that's also trying to read the instruction memory at the same time. So if I had you know, one unified storage unit that had both instructions and data, you would see that that same unified storage would have to service one data read operation over here and an instruction read operation at the same time. That would require a memory structure that has multiple read ports and that's expensive. Okay, so I've basically made the observation here that you know instructions can be placed in one specific storage unit. I'm going to call that the instruction memory and data can be placed in a separate storage unit called the data memory and by making these two structures distinct and having a single read port to both I can perform one instruction read at the same time that I'm performing a data read, right? And that allows the data memory to be read at the same time as a different instruction reading the instruction memory. So, you know, had I built a unified structure, there would have been a structural conflict. And by designing the structures more carefully, I have avoided this conflict. A second possible problem is that registers are being read and written to at the same time, right? And this is a problem you cannot really avoid. What I did in my example so far is I said that the register read takes half a cycle, register write takes half a cycle, and I'm going to use the first half of the cycle to perform the write, and I'm going to use the second half of the cycle to perform the reads. Okay, so that gives me a register file with one write port and two read ports, and I use the write port in the first half, and I use read ports in the second half. I could have also assumed that it takes an entire cycle to perform a write or an entire cycle to perform a read. And that's usually the common case. Okay, but again, you would need three ports. You would need one write port and you would need two read ports. Then another possible problem is the fact that the branch target only changes at the end of the second stage, right? So we discussed this in depth in the last video where I said that, you know, I'm going to make aggressive assumptions. I'm going to do a lot of work in the second stage and I'm going to finish the branch instruction as early as the second stage. But even with that, one cycle elapses where I'm not quite sure what to fetch, right? And so that leads to a problem as well. Okay, so I'm going to address each one of these problems. And these problems are referred to as hazards. So you have what is called a structural hazard, where there are multiple instructions trying to access the same resource in the same cycle. The easiest way to fix that problem is to throw more hardware at that problem, you know, provide more resources, and that allows multiple instructions to do the same things at the same time, right? So me separating the a unified storage unit into a separate instruction memory and data memory is one example of kind of dealing with a structural hazard. And also having you know multiple read ports and separate write ports, that's another way of dealing with a potential conflict. The next problem is referred to as a data hazard. So if one instruction depends on the previous instruction, we have to make sure that they are separated enough in time. And I gave you one brief example last time. I'll go into more depth later in this video. And the third problem is referred to as a control hazard, where I need to fetch an instruction, but I'm not yet quite sure which way I'm going. Okay, so again, we'll talk about this in, in great depth. And you've already seen one example. The data hazards are much harder to deal with, right? And we'll look at this in a lot more detail now. Okay, so before I get into data hazards, let's just introduce a little bit of terminology that will make this discussion a little simpler. So we said that there's an instruction I1 that is fetched in the first cycle, it's going through the different five stages of the pipeline. I'm going to refer to this instruction as a producer instruction. And I1 is going to produce a result that gets placed into, say, register R3. And we know that that happens in the fifth cycle over here. And it happens in the first half of the fifth cycle. Now, you, you could have an instruction later that wants to read the value of R3. I'm going to refer to this instruction as the consumer instruction. This instruction could show up as early as the second instruction. It could be I2, it could be I3, it could be I4, and so on. Now, the problem is that the value produced here needs to be fed to the second instruction. And the value is being produced in the first half of cycle five. So my consumption of that value needs to happen no earlier than cycle five. Okay, so essentially this is saying that, I, that the second consuming instruction has to perform its register read in the second half of cycle five. So this is my register read over here. 
okay and there's no way i can do this operation any earlier than that if i did it any earlier i would basically proceed with the wrong value okay so if this instruction starts executing so if that instruction happens to be i2 and starts executing as early as the second cycle it's possible i may have to delay this instruction so that the register read is performed in cycle 5 okay so let's look at this with some concrete examples i'm going to skip over these slides over here and go to this example depiction of instructions flowing through the pipeline. So there's instruction I1, which is taking the values and registers R1 and R2, adding them up, putting the result in R3. Then I, I2 is the second instruction in the program. It takes this value R3, adds it to R4, and puts the result in R5. Then the third instruction in the program is completely independent of the first two. It's taking two completely different registers, R7 and R8, adding them up, putting the result in R9. Okay, so let's see how these three instructions flow through the pipeline. So I1 is fairly simple. In cycle 1, it's going to be accessing the instruction memory. So I'm referring to that as the instruction fetch stage or the IF stage. In cycle 2, that same instruction moves to the second stage down here. I'm calling it the decode and register read stage. So far, I've not explained what decode means, but register read is what we've talked about before, right? Where in the second half of the cycle, I'm going to read values from the register file. And sorry, this should be instruction 1 going through the decode and rename stage in cycle 2. That same instruction I1 in cycle 3 goes through the third stage, which is the ALU stage. In cycle 4, it goes through data memory. In cycle 5, it performs the write into the register file. Now let's look at the second instruction I2. In cycle 2, you're going to start fetching instruction 2 from instruction memory. In cycle 3, that instruction advances to the decode and register read stage. So at this point, when you read the value of R3 and R4 from the register file, the value of R3 that you get is some outdated value. It's the old value of R3. It's not the value that I1 is producing, because the value that I1 is producing gets written into the register file in the first half of cycle 5. Right. So reading something from R3 in cycle three is going to give you some old value. So this is a failed read operation. And my decode stage is basically aware of what's going through the pipeline. So it knows that reading this value in cycle three is giving me something bogus. So it says, you know, let's not advance this instruction forward. Let's not let this instruction move to the ALU stage. Let me try reading this value again in the next cycle. So in cycle four, I2 does not move to the next stage in the pipeline it stays behind in the decode and rename stage and performs another decode and rename. And again, the decode stage is smart enough to know that this is also going to be a failed read, right? Because reading R3 in cycle four is still earlier in time than when the write is going to happen, right? Because we know that R3 is updated down here in cycle five. So the decode stage says, you know, again, this instruction is not ready to move ahead to the next stage. Let's keep it again in the decode stage so again in cycle 5, I make my third attempt to read from the register file. The register read happens in the second half of cycle 5, and that's after the write has happened. So now when you read the value in R3, you do get the value that was produced by instruction 1. So now you've succeeded. Now you're ready to move on to the next stage. So you move on to the ALU stage. Subsequently, you move on to the data memory stage, and then finally to the register write stage. Let's look at instruction three. It gets fetched in cycle three. It wants to move on to the decode and rename stage in cycle four, but I2 is still sitting there and kind of holding up those resources. So I3 is held up behind I2. This is in spite of the fact that I3 is doing something completely independent and is not dependent on instructions before it, right? If it gets values in R7 and R8, it can proceed with its operation. But you can't jump ahead of people that are in front of you. Right? This is also referred to as an in-order pipeline. So I3 is forced to stay back in the first stage. So it stays back here and really does nothing in cycle, cycle 4. Again in cycle 5, it is held back over here. And then ultimately, once I2 advances, it allows I3 to advance behind it. So finally, now I3 moves on to the second stage. It reads its register values, gets the values of R7, R8. The decode stage is smart enough to know that these are correct values. 
and so it lets i3 advance further move on to the ALU stage, the data memory stage, and then finally the register write stage. So you'll see that an, an instruction finished in cycle five, and then two cycles went by where nothing finished. Those were the bubbles or the stall cycles in my pipeline. And then finally you have an instruction finishing in cycle eight, in cycle nine, and so on. All right, so when you look at the average CPI, if everything goes well, the CPI is the, is the best case value of one. And every time something bad happens, you're adding to the CPI, right? So in this case, two stall cycles happened. And so in this example, I had two stall cycles for three instructions. So the average CPI is 1.66. And you know, this is assuming that I'm starting to count after the pipeline has warmed up, right? So starting in cycle five, I'm finishing instructions at the rate of, you know, 1.66 cycles per instruction completion.